Hi guys and thank you for tuning in. In this video I will talk you through the basics of mechanical ventilation and give you a crash course on using a ventilator in the pre-hospital setting. So without further ado, let's dive into 5 tips of mechanical ventilation. Right, it's nothing set in stone, right? Treat it more as a father's advice. Just kidding, I am not your father. Before you will start fiddling with the machine itself, make sure that your patient is properly ventilated. I've seen too many patients struggling for breath whilst a lead clinician was trying to set the ventilator. Observe your patient's chest rise and fall. Ascultate the chest for bilateral entry and check the ETCO2. I would not rely on SPO2 sensors as values are displayed with approximately 30-40 seconds delay and may be not reliable if your patient is in cardiac arrest, shock or hypothermia. Some educated fools will tell you that the most important link of the mechanical ventilation chain is the ventilator itself. That's not true. The best machine will be useless if your patient tube is misplaced or the cuff is not inflated properly. Therefore, please check the depth of the intubation, which should be your patient's estimated height times 0.1 plus 4. This is so-called Chula formula and it's clinically superior to 2321 rule. The whole science behind it is described here. The pressure of the tube scuff should be controlled with a dedicated device and I will leave the relevant links uh, in the description to this video. Please do not just inflate the cuff with 10 ml of air. The diameter of your patient's trachea is approximately 2 cm and the cuff inflated with 10 ml of air is just simply too big and this may cause a tissue necrosis and subsequently sepsis. Speaking of the airway, many people ask me, oh my patient is on IGEL, can I put them on ventilator? Yes you can. And this study proves that it is safe to use supraglottic devices in mechanically ventilated patients up to 27 hours. However, some cadaver studies indicate that air pressures higher than 20 cm of water are associated with varying degrees of oesophageal insufflation. But I will tell you more about different pressures in a second. Positive and expiratory pressure. So, how much pressure is going to be left in the circuit and the end of exhale? PEEP helps us to recruit alveoli. The higher the PEEP, the more alveoli you can recruit and the higher oxygenation is. Usually it's set to 5 cm of water. The next term is FiO2, fraction of inspired oxygen. So, how much volume of your patient's breath is going to be oxygen? Usually it's set to anything from 50 to 100%. My is set to 100%, i.e. inspiration to expiration ratio, usually set to 1 to 2, which mimics physiological respirations, but you can come across 1 to 4 or even 1 to 5, usually in asthma or SARS patients. Peak pressure is a pressure created by the ventilator to overcome airway and alveoli resistance to deliver desired tidal volume. It is set very individually, but usually in ICU patients you will come across uh, values of 20 to 30. It matters predominantly in pressure-related ventilation. In volume-related ventilation, it will just trigger the alarm. Tidal volume. So different textbooks will give you uh, different numbers, but usually it is 6 to 8 mils uh, of air per kilo of ideal body mass. How do you count your patient's ideal body mass? Well, estimate your patient's height and deduct 100. So, for 190 centimeters patient, the ideal body mass would be 90 kilos. For 165 centimeters height, 65 kilos. And so on, so on, so on. So, with a ventilator, there are many ways to put air into your patient. You can put an air into somebody based on the volume. You can inflate them to a certain pressure. You may have a ventilator in charge of when patient gets a breath, or you may leave this decision to the patient. Each one of these ways of ventilation is called a mode, and there are plenty of them. CPAP, AC, uh, SIMV, PC, and so on, so on, so on. And in theory, different modes are suitable for different clinical situations. But to make this video digestible, for pre-hospital clinicians, I will limit it to two most common situations, cardiac arrest and ROSC. Let's start with cardiac arrest. Unfortunately, there is no consistency to what mode should be used. There is low level of evidence and lack of detailed recommendations. So, you have two options here. 
Option 1. IPPV mode. Intermittent positive pressure ventilation. As my friend Tomex wrote in his article, it is the most used ventilator mode in out of hospital cardiac arrest. It's easy, but quite brutal. The machine will deliver the set volume of air in set time regardless of any respiratory effort from patient. The other study worth mentioning is this, where authors developed their own strategy called 6 dial, which consists of PIP0 to support the venous return, tidal volume of 8 mils per kilo, respiratory rate of 10 per minute, IE ratio 1 to 5 and a really high peak pressure of 60 cm of water because of the negative pressure created during the chest compressions may trigger the alarm. Anyway, in plain English, if your patient is in cardiac arrest, just set the ventilator for volume controlled mode, give them 100% of oxygen and set the respiratory rate for between 10 and 12 and set the alarm for peak pressure quite high. But let's be honest, the best way to deal with a cardiac arrest scenario is to use a dedicated mode for cardiac arrest. Be careful, not all machines do have it. CPR mode is called differently in different ventilators, for example CCSV CPR or CIMV CPR, but usually the name has CPR on the end. This mode turns off all unwanted alarms and automatically set the best settings. Now. ROSC. In this case, majority of studies support the use of CMV mode. CMV stands for Continuous Mandatory Ventilation, also known as Assist Control. In uh, simple words, it means that the patient triggers the ventilator and the machine just supports the breathing to reach the programmed value. Remember that you want to treat the patient, not the monitor, so do not stare at the monitor, stare at the human being and treat what you see. Speaking of the monitor, you may feel slightly overwhelmed with all those different values and not really know which one is the most important. Well, they are all important, but in my humble opinion, the most important in pre-hospital setting is ETCO2. That's the value you should focus on. Now, do you remember the definitions we've learned at the beginning of the session? Respiratory rate, tidal volume, FiO2 and PEEP. The first two parameters, so respiratory rate and tidal volume, are going to affect carbon dioxide. And the last two, so PEEP and FiO2, are going to affect oxygenation. So we can manipulate those values to get the effect required. And the last thing, never ever hesitate to ask for help. If you feel that this mechanical ventilation goes wrong, call for more experienced colleague. And that's it guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, please subscribe to the channel and hit like button. It will really help my channel to grow. I want to also give a big shout out to a couple of people who supported me with this episode. So, Dr. Piotr Zidron, Hans Paramedic Tomek Janos, Jake Rachman from Simulation Man, uh, my assistant David, and the most important person, James Oakland from Imperial Costumes. My name is Alex Hepner and this was Group Call.